Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what PLG is, and then um, and and we plan to make this a super interactive session. So throw stuff in the chat, interact with us. We've got lots of questions. We've got lots of questions. You've got lots of questions. Hopefully somebody around here has some answers and, and we'll go with it from there. But before we get into the six things, um, let's talk a little bit about product-led growth. But before I talk about what it is, I wanna talk a little bit about my own confession because um, this will make a lot more sense if you understand me. I'm a cynic about marketing. I I've been in marketing for well over a decade. I've run multiple marketing teams, but I'm a cynic. Um, and I tend to make fun of trends. So inbound marketing, look, people actually want to learn stuff. Who knew? Of course, I had that attitude while I was at HubSpot and we were making inbound marketing happen, but that's neither here nor there. Then there was social selling. I'm like, oh, look, sales learned that people are human on the internet. Um, then account-based marketing, or as I always used to call it, sales, now with an actual marketing assist. I also worked for an ABM platform when I had that attitude. And then for the last few years, every time somebody talks about product led red growth, I always say, or what we used to call freemium. But I was wrong. So um, fundamentally, while we look at product led growth as having its fundamentals in the freemium motion, um, it's really an end user focused model. It relies on the product itself, its primary driver. Um, and that's what we're going to be digging into later today. What it's not is the underpants now. I sometimes see um, CEOs going like, we have to do the PLG as if it's like PLG, hmm, profit. So it's not the underpants now. And fundamentally, at least the way we're looking at it during this presentation is that PLG is using your product to grow your business or sell your product with your product or whatever tagline you like to use there. Breezy, you're right, putting your product at the center of everything you do. That's from the chat. <laughs> now, I wanted to look at this. So, so I talked to a lot of um, enterprise sales organizations, um, including, my, including our own at Reprise. This is how we started our sales organization. Um, and I wanted to take a look at how the B2B marketing funnel would work if we used it to sell cars. Take a little trip with me, pun intended. Okay. So we've got some basic basic stages here. Um, you can call them whatever you want, but awareness, interest, consideration, intent, evaluation, and purchase, where evaluation is basically the sales process. And if you don't know what purchase is, I'm not really sure why you're here today. So that was supposed to be a joke. It wasn't good. Let's go. Awareness. So we wanna make people aware of cars. So we're gonna do thought leadership material on transportation benefits. Now we're not gonna show them the car, we're just gonna educate them on that. And then when we get to interest, right? It's like, oh, the benefits of our approach to transportation, right? Our, our general philosophy behind it, we want you to really think about the cars, the way that we do, but we're still not gonna show you a car. Okay, your consideration, we're trying to get you as lead, right? We're gonna allow you to register and download a brochure on how to plan a road trip, right? Because if you're gonna do a road trip, you're gonna need to buy a car eventually, right? We're not gonna show you a car still. Intent, okay, you're starting to give like buying signals. So now you do a request a visit form, you can request a demo uh, with the benefits of talking to the dealer. With the dealer, you're going to learn the following. You're going to learn what a car is, what colors it comes from, how to drive it. I'm, I'm not really sure. That, that would be a really bad landing page, but that was off the top of my head. Still no pictures of a car. Now you get to the dealership, and the dealer asks you questions about what you want. Right? It's the disco discovery. They're still not showing you the car. And the second visit, finally, you see it, but you don't touch the car. The dealer is driving the car in front of you, telling you about the car, but you're not in the car or touching the car. In fact, you don't get to touch the car until you buy the car, but you can't really drive it until our customer success team shows you how and takes the first eight trips with you. Anybody buy a car like that? I don't actually own a car. Fun fact. Matt, did you, have you ever bought a car, car like this? Um, I have not. I just wrote, like talk, talk about making up what is typically a bad experience and making it significantly worse. But I, think <laughs> it's a good, I mean, it's a, it's a good analogy of like, and this is this is often how we sell software, how we, yeah. we, we sell today historically. So why the heck do we do this to our prospects? Why? 
Um, and so digging into this, and I hear a lot of objections about product-led growth. Um, competition is number one. What if they see our product? I have a somewhat snarky response to this, which is they already have seen your product. Get over it. Uh, I don't deliver it quite like that to CEOs when I talk to them. But um, I don't know, I, I don't know exactly the folks who were on the call, but I've had demo decks sent to me unsolicited by sales reps who got them unsolicited from their customers, right? I'm pretty sure that there are folks that have gotten a free trial of a software and done a Loom recording of what it is and sent it to a competitor. Right? Fundamentally, you've, it's going to be really hard to be very buyer centric in your process if you're scared about what might get out to the wild. Another thing is how we've been trained to be marketers, those of us in marketing, right? We've been told lead with the benefits, not this feature, sell the sizzle, not the steak. The thing is that when you roll a bunch of things all the way up to the top benefit, we all sound like clones. Like, so in the MarTech landscape of 85 bazillion companies, every single one tells me how they're gonna grow my revenue. They don't necessarily tell me how, but every single one sells the same thing. So you end up selling, sounding like clones. And then of course, the biggest hurdle to product like growth is that engineering doesn't have, have the bandwidth to deal with it, right? They say they can't produce what we need. Sometimes we, uh, if we're the marketing team or the sales team, we kind of, we might not actually know what we need, right? We, we, we're not thinking about what the customer needs um, before they buy to be able to touch and feel the product and, and really get involved with this. And what's always interesting to me is that car, car funnel, um, an analogy aside, B2C actually nails product like growth. Right. I, we all hate opening blister packaging. I don't know how many times I've cut myself. I'm also clumsy, but whatever. And yet, look, it's product led growth. You get to see the product, right? In fact, sometimes there's a little like try me or, or whatever, or there's a little window in the plastic, like the bop it. Um, when we're buying a house, um, we go see it. And of course, when we're buying a car, we do test drive it and actually see the car. Oops. And so fundamentally, this becomes a people are people everywhere and trying to sell your product without your product uh, doesn't, doesn't actually make sense. And of course, we've got some numbers to match, right? We've got 43% of buyers are gravitating to rep-free experiences. And of course, it's getting more and more common as the buyer committee kind of gets to the younger and younger generations, right? Because it turns out we all turn older. And, you know, 58% of buyer site demonstrations is a call to action they would respond to in a marketing campaign. In other words, they want to see the dang thing. And demos are the, one of the most valuable materials during the buying cycle. Again, they want to see the dang thing. And so now I will turn the, the primary MCing over here to Matt, who's going to talk us through the six primary PLG GTM motions, because we really liked our TLAs. We do, and, and you're going to drive the slides. I will kind of walk us through this, and I, I will lead this discussion. And I'm counting on. I'm, I'm looking at some people that are joining us here today, and like I think they should they, they should be on stage here with us because I read a lot of their stuff and I've been learning a lot of what you're going to hear today in terms of best practices, worst practices, pros and cons of these different efforts. I'm learning from what you guys are doing out in the field. But let's get kick in. Um, if here's here's what maybe we should do. I think everybody is. Um, active participant in this group. If you have something you want to share with the group, if you want to use the raise hand feature, I think we should be able to promote you to a speaker um, and have you chime in on this. Uh, but feel free to throw questions and comments into the chat as well, and we will reference those um, and just would love to get a, just a broader conversation going. So let's do it. Let's go to the first one. All right, freemium. Um, so basically, freemium means you got a version of the product, right, that is free. Uh, this assumes that in many cases, it's not a free trial. This is a free version forever. Um, you're reducing barriers to entry. You're making sure people are familiar with the product. They're getting some sense for sort of how the product works. And they're building, if you do it right, you're building some interest in, 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 in the non-scarcity of the premium feature. So you're saying, okay, you're limited to only five a month with freemium, but you can have unlimited if you buy, or you're limited to only three searches a week or three searches period versus 10 or unlimited if you start to buy. Um, couple, so general, 
would love to sort of talk about some of the pros and cons of using this 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 offering. Um, I think to know what features to put into that, to know what to limit or what to throttle, you really have to know your audience really well um, to, to, to give them an experience that's valuable in and of itself. But at some point, you got to, I think part of the job here is to make sure that there that is very clear that there's an unlocking of value beyond what they're getting for free. Yeah, in product messaging is really important. But I really liked what you said about you need to know what's valuable to them. Hilariously, you might not, especially if you're in marketing, right? You've been selling the sizzle, not the steak. Um, and so I found it really valuable to go to my CS team. Uh, yeah, sales knows what, what the aha moments are in the demo. But when it comes to what should be in freemium, CS probably has data, right? They've probably been stalking your customers as they use your product. And so they can really help prioritize features there. Yeah, I, 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 I give a couple examples of companies that I think, one example of a company that does a really nice job with freemium, one that I think does not right now. And I hope for the one that does not, we don't have people from their company here. I, I think Slack does a really nice job uh, with a freemium version. I mean, like anyone can start using Slack. Uh, and I think they've done a really nice job of selecting um, features that are limits. I mean, the, the archive feature in Slack is phenomenal. I can't tell you how many companies and, and groups I've seen people like immediately covet the pro version of Slack because after a certain number of messages, the older stuff just literally goes away. Now Slack is keeping it for you when you convert, uh, but they're really good at giving you a great experience and you continue to have this great experience, but the old stuff goes away and you miss it. Um, an example of a company I don't feel like does a very good job, and maybe I'm missing something around it, is Crossbeam. So Crossbeam is a really interesting tool. It's sort of a partner sales, partner marketing tool that lets you sort of share overlaps of customers and prospects and opportunities with other partners and literally see where you can go and co-sell. Um, I say that it's, I don't know how to give them money. Like, I'm a, I'm a I feel like we're- really? I was just wondering that the other day. Sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but no, no, absolutely. Saying, like, I, I, I've got a bunch of partner interactions. I'm literally using it every day. It is becoming a bigger part of sort of pipeline and partner relationships. I would give them a lot of money. I don't know how to. I mean, I don't. I literally don't know where to go. And so there's there's just so much value in the free version there that there isn't tension for me. There isn't a tension to say like, how do I give you, and, and no one's asking for it either. I keep waiting for someone to sort of say, well, you seem to be in this a lot. Like, would you like to unlock these other features? There's no right. other anywhere. So I don't understand that one. I was literally wondering where the limits were um, the other day because we've been using it more and more and more. Um, I just keep, I can't help but wonder if it's one of these, like, once they get us all hooked, they're going to say, okay, now we're going to cut you off or not. Because wasn't that, that used to be how a lot of, it was almost like free trial. Um, and then that's a good way to piss off a lot of people. Well, I was just going to say, like, that's not a good strategy. I, I, if, AJ, if you had, if one of your best friends VP product Crossby, I don't mean to say, look, I love Crossby. I just think they should be taking some of my money. And I, and I talked to a lot of our partners that like, they kind of feel like the same way. Last point, I know we want to move to other sections here, but thank you everyone for, um, for getting active in the chat. This last point about it not being free to you is important. So like free for the customer yeah. to use it, but every person using it for a version of your product, there's an incremental cost to you as a business to operate that free version. And I bring this up to say, who are you letting have that free version? Who are you marketing it to? Like, are these the kind of customers that you want? Are they using it the way, in a way that is going to naturally compel some of them to want the premium features? Right. And so again, like if you know your audience, if you know what features you're promoting, if you are precise in how you are marketing it out, the, the higher percent of those freemium users that are potential paid users um, is significant. And that's not a, that's yeah. not an immaterial thing to consider. And freemium does tend to bring in uh, down market. So you'll find a lot more emerging businesses. Um, yes, you get your tire kickers from big companies, but sometimes they've got security issues that'll, that don't allow them to use the free version. And what I found pretty much is if you're selling to the, the a smaller company or a really emerging growth segment, freemium is almost the price of admission, um, but you need to be aware if you're heading up market, um, you're gonna grab down market people when you put something free out. Yep. All right, let's move on to the next one. Free trial. Um, similar goal, I think, and I'd love for anyone to challenge me on this, but I think very similar goal. Obviously, the big difference is freemium tends to be a light version of your product. Free trial often means you're getting you know, most, if not all, of the product. 
Um, obviously, to be able to immerse yourself in everything, there isn't any sort of hidden anything behind the curtain. You're getting to sort of see and experience everything. Um, some ser services this work better, Jen, than with others. If you have a complex tool, um, like getting a free trial of Tableau <laughs> might be a challenge because you, you wouldn't be able to utilize it to its, its best advantage unless you actually do get some training around it. And sometimes taste tests aren't enough either yeah. because you aren't able to sort of fully grasp what it can do, or you don't have enough time to see the ROI around it. Yeah, although Tableau actually had a good PLG motion because you could view other people's stuff and do some basic cut and paste and whatever. And then when you tried to really do something to the data, you had to pay for it. It was not- Now I would it. argue that that's either, that's either a deep fake or a snack, right? I think that's a different motion. Yes, yeah, that's not a free trial. Yeah, You're totally so right. yeah. Say like, here's an empty vessel, go do something with it, um, that's going to be a challenge, um, yeah. you know, for, for that. So um, is it really free um, is another question. I put the little meme here around, so a free 30-day trial, but we need your credit card first. Like, I get why people are doing that, and there's there's a there's a legit strategy to assure, to assume, to ensure you have sort of motivated people getting that free, because a free trial, again, not free to you, you still have to sort of provide that entire customer experience, essentially, to every one of those prospects. But that is a gate, right? And some people, you know, so that and if, and if you're gating and if you're seeing that some of your target prospects aren't going through, this may, this, you may want to replace for trial with a different motion, whether it's freemium or, uh, you know, the, the deep fake scenario might be perfect in that kind of place as well. Uh, yeah, but the point on integrations, um, security companies have a really hard time with this because how are you going to say, here's your free trial? We just need to integrate with all of your sensitive back end systems first. Yeah. Uh, and what we find um, at Reprise is that while we have a free version that doesn't have a whole lot of um, bells and whistles on it, our primary platform is complex enough that free trials are better when you've got an SE to come alongside you. Yeah. Speaking of that, would you equate a free trial with like a proof of concept? Yes. <laughs> It could be like, um, uh, you know, POCs are often the price of admission into if you're doing true, true enterprise sales, right? If you're selling into a giant organization, um, doing it via a free trial is one thing, but I usually think of a proof of concept as a, a paid trial almost. Yeah. Uh, and maybe it's that I played in the enterprise for too long, but you know, it's, it's complex enough and requires enough that I kind of want some money in response, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, well, yeah. I like, so a couple things there. One, I like your idea of a facilitated free trial. If you're saying, listen, we're going to give you full access to the software, but we're also going to give you a sales engineer who is going to help you get this set up and help you walk it through. Obviously, that is not available for everyone. You have to qualify for that. Right. Um, right. The proof of concept, I mean, just like giving your credit card up front for a free trial, um, sort of paying for a proof of concept is a gate to assure some motivation and participation. Um, but I'm also like, you know, when, before I started uh, this business, I worked, I ran marketing for a clean tech company. And it was all about power management, centrally managed at the server level. And so instead of deploying power management software on 60,000 PCs in an enterprise, we've deployed on a few hundred. Right. right. It was a controlled state and we, and we, our sales engineers would go in and sort of deploy it and manage it and say, assuming these PCs are acting like the other 60,000 or so, like here's the kind of cost savings you can see, here's the kind of benefit and it brings it to life. So it's kind of like a free trial for those 600 um, PCs, but it's again, a facilitated free trial proof of concept so you can tell a more specific story to a company. Yeah, yeah, and Breezy just commented that she sees CSMs for tier one companies assigned, but then product specialists, which are kind of a lower level, basically BDR-ish role for other levels um, to be, and I think I've heard it called a, like a trial Sherpa, somebody to come alongside you and take you through it. Really fascinating point, because we we're gonna get to land and expand here in a little bit. And you know, I think when you do land and expand too often, companies think of land as the closed one. If the real, if the real, like revenue opportunities with the expand, then the land is really like, man, is that SQL level? Like, you, I mean, you're yeah. sort of like interested, but not still not paying us a lot. But you're clearly, once you get to that point from land, you're gonna have CS and account management teams working that deal. Would that would you say the same thing? Or could you apply that to a free trial environment? Well, if you have a facilitated free trial, why wouldn't you have people that aren't just sales engineers, but are success or success managers, account managers, working those deals earlier in the process to ensure that they're seeing, seeing impact, ensure they can see and visualize 
what this would look like if they paid for it long term. Right, because you've got people who need to support um, product actions instead of people who just need to chase down deal cha deal stages. And I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said just chase down deal deal stages because it's a really hard job. But um, the, it's two different functions, really. Oh come on, Jen. You know enterprise sales is easy. Everyone knows it. Um, all right. Oh, clearly. Let's, yeah. Let's <laughs> let's move on. Um, deep fakes. Um, I'll let you walk through this one, Jen. <laughs> Some people really hate when it's called deep fakes, but we have the example of Pendo right here, and that's what they called them, I swear. Um, and these are lightweight product, product tours. So they could, it's clickable, it's usually guided. Um, it allows folks to touch and see things. How does this feature work? How does this work, right? In a way that's not a video that can be really annoying if like your Bluetooth headphones are dead right now. Um, and so it, you just get a lot more comfort with, for, with what's behind the curtain. And I will say, if you want to see this done super well, thanks, Alex, exactly that. Um, Pedos take a tour, call to action, does this really well. Uh, they'll let you see two tours before they'll gate them, just so you know. Uh, and that, but, but fundamentally, they break them down, just any kind of like, they break them down basically by persona or by usage. So basically, any way you want to use it, you can see the, the pieces of the product that are the most important. And so that's how I think about deep fakes. Matt, what do you have to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it's all kind of an evolved version of sort of a free trial. I mean, if you think about, if you're doing this well, so if you think about this as a facilitated, you know, guide into the product so you can literally see how it works, you feel like you're actually within it and using it. Um, I think you still clearly to do that, you have to sort of know the why there's still like just like any demo or any sort of, you know, product feature conversation, there has to be some storytelling behind it about like what is this achieving what was the problem. I mean, it's still still the, you know, you have the, the customer is the hero, the product is the sword, what is it, what is it fighting against right like and so what is it trying to achieve like, you know that that thought needs to go into this, um, and it can't just be like walking people through features. Um, right. I think it's also like you make sure the tools are helpful. I think um, there should be a stack ranking of what you walk people through. Like I've seen a lot of companies, both in the demos they do in the sales environment, as well as sort of, you know, orientations with a new product, be like they need to walk people through every single feature right away. Right. Um, we work with a company years ago that, that was, it was a community uh, tool for real estate agents. And it was, it was part community, part SEO. You can write blog posts, you can get leads from it. Um, and the initial onboarding, like walk people through the entire, like all the features. And it was, it was, it was pretty intimidating. So what we did is we identified what, what are the one or two features that create those holy shit moments, right? I don't know if we can swear on Pavilion uh, webinars, but I guess we'll find out. If, uh, <laughs> Um, we call them wow moments or aha moments usually. I like my description better, but I won't say it again. So I, okay. But the whole point is like you you identify the one or two features or experiences you can create that where the prospect says, "Oh my gosh, this works! Oh my gosh, I can see how this is going to benefit for you." Now I am even extra motivated to keep going, right? And so right. that works in new employee orientation, new employee works in new customer orientation and customer sort of onboarding. It also matters when you're doing whether it's a recorded demo or deep fakes in terms of the experience they get to see. Yeah, and. You know, it also um, helps you walk through some of those complex situations that we were talking about in the past uh, before um, about like integrations that are hard. If you look actually at these screenshots, you can see Pendo, you know, like some of their integrations down here. And because it's a deep fake, it's not the real product. It's just kind of a clickable version of the front end. Um, you could put guardrails around it, show an integration really quickly and easily so that, especially if you have a technical customer that tends to buy, they really like to see how it works and having them click is actually a really big piece of their psyche and persona. Cool, let's move on. Snacks, everybody loves snacks. Where's Kevin Marasco? He runs marketing at Zenefits. They're the masters of this. Uh, wh what are some snippets of, of content, snippets of value you can create and deliver to your prospects that lets them see some of the value it can provide? Are you saying it's samples of data, um, discussion guides? I would, I would honestly say that um, HubSpot's website analyzer 
was a snack. I wouldn't say, I mean, it's content, but I would say that that was a snack of what they could provide. Um, I see uh, in the professional services space, uh, I see a common call to action as a you know, request a strategy call, right? It's not a, I want a demo. It's not, I want a capabilities discussion, but let's, let's talk about the work you need done. Let's actually start getting into the work right now. Um, a 30 minute call that is a strat, sort of a short strategy call is a snack of what you could get in a consulting engagement with a company like that. Um, I, I mean, and I don't know where the line is, Jen. I mean, is, is ROI, calcul ROI calculator, is that too marketing -y? Or is that like, are you, are, are, is there an opportunity where you could actually make that snackable too? Gosh, an ROI, I'm like, I don't know if you're selling an ROI calculator, it's absolutely, a, it's absolutely a snack if you're selling a business that actually builds them. I'm not really sure because what I think of the snack is like, this is kind of what it looks like. So for example, I've done a thought leadership piece about, let's say, say I'm Tableau and I do a thought leadership piece about data in sports. I'm just picking examples out of the air. And um, I show the data in the Tableau environment in, in the thought leadership piece, right? So that to me is absolutely a product snack, right? You get to see what it looks like. You have an interesting piece about what you've done with it. So that, I think that's very much data, data samples. Um, I don't have an ROI calculator answer. I'm curious to know what folks on this call think is an ROI calculator. It may be it may be on the fence. I, you know, the other point I didn't I didn't put in the in the bullets here is that you know snacks. I think you kind of referenced it. it. Snacks don't have to be free. Like I can give you a free sample of that. I can give you a free thirty minute con, you know sort of strategy call. Um, I can also make you pay for it. Right. I yeah. can say, well, you know, you don't have to sign up for if you're Accenture like a four million dollar multi year you know consulting engagement. But what's something you could we could do for you in a workshop? Right? What's something we could do for you in a smaller, tighter format that doesn't create the full commitment, but lets you experience some of the value of what we provide. So just like the POC, maybe the POC belongs more in the snack environment than the free trial or facilitated free trial. Um, and again, like I think the point here is not to sort of get perfect organization of all these different efforts, but again, just to kind of explore the different nature of PLG motions um, and the different possibilities. There isn't a one size fits all. These are not mutually exclusive. Um, you know, there's many companies that leverage multiple of these motions um, in parallel, uh, integrated with each other and at different stages of the prospect of buying journey. Yeah, and I would argue like pick what works for you mm -hmm. um, and, and do it lightweight. I did want to go back to your point on the website grader for HubSpot because um, I was early HubSpot. I was like employee number 90 at HubSpot. And so that's before anybody had ever heard of us. And we used the website grader as an amazing lead gen tool because we knew this was before intent data was even a thing. But if somebody did the website grader, then they were concerned about how their website was performing on the internet. And therefore they were showing basically a clear intent signal and giving us an email address so that we could call them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think Anything you can do to make it to reduce the barrier of entry to make it easier for people to see it and then easier for people to sort of share that with others. I mean, and don't forget, like independent of sort of, you know, PLG or account lease motions. I mean, when you're selling it to enterprise, it's not one decision maker. There's a buying committee and our job is to try to orchestrate internal consensus building. Like no matter what you do externally, no matter how good your sales team is, the most powerful thing that's going to get you a deal is if the internal group reaches consensus on a need to change and on who they should work with moving forward. And so like building that case, depending on the role and depending on what they need to see may require multiple of these motions working together. Yeah, everybody wants something different. Perfect. All right, let's go to the next one. Usage-based pricing. So is this, is this, um, and we call this out as a separate topic, but is this just a variation of sort of freemium versus paid? Hmm. I mean, it's basically, the, it's kind of the freemium motion, but I feel like there's two humps to get over. When you go free to paid, it's kind of a, you know, large activation energy. If you go to, from paid to paid a little more, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's as hard. Yeah. I don't think it is either. I, I think what the, 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 the customer experience here is really, really important. Like I've seen, I mean, I use a number of products that I will not name where I've got a certain number of seats um, and we're not a big company. So I might have like, 
you know, so something like a proposal tool, I might have like four or five seats. If I need to add another seat, I have to go through a whole nother like procurement process to get that additional seat. And you're just like, can I please just upgrade from inside the dang product? Well, literally, yeah. I mean, so most of these products, like if you want to add a user, there's an add user button, but it only works if there's a deficit of users. Like if you have five seats and you're only using three, you can add two more people. And so if you click that button again, this is about this is about orchestrating the experience. If you want to charge people on a usage basis, on a seat basis, that's fine. But like, let people give you money. Crossbeam, I'm still looking at you. Like, let me give you, maybe, <laughs> maybe add more users to Crossbeam internally. Like, I'm, I keep, I literally have been trying different things to figure out like, when are they going to tell me to give them money? Um, Crossbeam, I love you, but seriously. Um, but I think about like, you know, how how easy do you make it to let people start using? And is there a combination of user-based pricing and snacks? Is there a combination of user-based pricing and freemium where maybe you've got like five people with, with full-on licensed seats for a product? You know, the sixth or seventh person doesn't necessarily need to be paying. Is there a freemium experience for them to get started so they get hooked? And does that increase the likelihood that you're going to convert into a full paid customer? So again, like think about as you're think about the experience of people adding uh, users and what that scenario looks like can give you some guides on how, how to interact with. Yeah. Okay, Breezy, you've got Breezy, your hand up. You took your 30, so I've been hoping you were going to raise your hand. We're going to call on you. We're getting tired of listening to each other talk. This is a thing. <laughs> I, I couldn't. I just I had to jump in on on this usage of based pricing. Um, <laughs> hey, everyone. I'm Breezy. I work at a company called Correlated. I think I know a lot of you at this point. Um, but uh, anyway, so on usage based pricing, it's interesting. I uh, was interviewing uh, the SVP of, of sales and customer experience yesterday at customer um, had him on the podcast. So and hopefully like a month or so you'll get to listen to that if you want. But um, I think it's interesting because a lot of companies are doing like a hybrid of a seats based pricing and usage based pricing. So I think the the key to thinking about what makes sense on the pricing side, in my opinion, is to just figure out what's going to be the most transparent and clear way for your customers to interpret that pricing. So um, in their example at at customer, um, a seats-based model was actually more clear because their competitors at the time had been doing a usage-based model and people didn't understand that. So by giving a seats base, they could, they could not feel like their customers were getting nickel and dimed. Um, but then once they started um, doing a certain other action of like sending messages to folks, then the usage-based pricing made more sense because you were like, well, I'm only sending X amount of messages per month. Um, and so it, it would seem like more fair to give the pricing on the usage base side. So anyway, two cents yeah. there on, on how to drive that uh, is based on kind of what the interpretation of it might be. Yeah. Um, and who that. is interpreting it? Like, um, it's really hard to like, I found that especially at small startups, developers are so accustomed to cloud-based pricing and the way that you use things there. And then they try to roll exactly that pricing to say a marketing persona or a completely different persona. And they're like, why are you limiting me here? Et cetera. Like there's, there's, we're not used to thinking of it like that. We're used to thinking of it like I buy a, a platform, I, it has this many seats or this many this or this many that, and I upgrade if I need to and not, oh my gosh, I have to worry about how many people hit this on my website, right? And a developer has a very different attitude towards it because they're accustomed to the idiosyncrasies of AWS. Well, and knowing again, just back to sort of knowing your customer, sort of orchestrating that experience through the product. I mean, like you know, Tom and others are talking about, it's not just based on the um, the seats; it's also based on what you get out of it. I think being able to communicate the opportunity cost of not using it more, right? You could say, well, I see that you're currently like using, you know, you know, five of X or something. And I think actually Vacasa, which is a um, short-term rental management tool, um, we, we use for a property we have. Uh, you know, when we book an owner stay, it tells us, it says, you know, by booking this owner stay, you are potentially giving up X amount of rental revenue. Right? So they've gone and calculated how much I'm losing by not getting paid. And when I'm not getting paid, my cost doesn't get paid because they take a percentage. So I think thinking about not just like encouraging people to use more, but calculating the opportunity and the opportunity cost, positive and or negative of those decisions. And don't assume that your prospect knows how to do that math. Don't assume that your customer 
understands the value equation they're getting into there. Um, our friend David Kirkdorfer, where is he wearing his marketing hat? Love it. Have asked a good question. That is a bit of a broad question, Jen, about like how to identify and reduce friction in the motions. So I would say in some cases you want friction, right? Like you want friction because it's gonna if it's gonna compel action. I would say the friction that exists in losing the archives in Slack is 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 annoying, but is a good friction. There's a clear way to reduce friction. Pay me, right? Um, but I think in general, you know, there can be those annoying experiences as well. We were talking about sort of adding seats. Someone mentioned like Zoom makes it difficult to do that. A lot of tools just make it just way too um dogmatic or um you know, draconian to sort of add to, to pay them more money to add seats so what are some strategies that you have you know, that we that you've seen work that can reduce that friction when that needs when that yeah, needs? yeah just because i have to rant about zoom for a moment the worst is when somebody has signed up for a free seat and then you've got to convert them to your pay paid plan and then everybody's confused and okay sorry ha huh, just had to get that off my chest <laughs> so um you know, it's, you can guess and check, right? You can, but but going through and saying, okay, if I'm my persona, like in, in my case, I'm my persona, or at least half of my personas, right? We sell, sell the sales and marketing people, like what drives me crazy? <laughs> and so let's not do that. But what would make me consider buying? So let's do that. And so, and so I feel like it's always a matter of put yourself in your prospect's shoes, um, figure out where the good friction is and accept it when you get it wrong. <laughs> Well, I look, and, and Jimmy brought, brings up how Gong does it. Like, you know, add away, just keep adding people and we'll come back and we'll, you know, we'll bill you later. I, I would argue that Marketo uh, played has, has historically, maybe they don't anymore, but for a long time they played that where, you know, you buy, you buy a Marketo and you pay for Marketo for up to X amount of, you know, names in your database. Like, so like, you know, if you have a hundred thousand, you know, license for a hundred thousand names, if you go to 101, they don't shut you off. They let you keep adding. Like you can add as many as you want. And then at a certain point, you're going to get a call from someone saying, hey, I noticed you got 125,000 people. That's above what you pay for. You know, you have until X date to either like get a higher subscription level or, you know, if some of those are bad names, you can take them out. So now it's, it's a takeaway. It's a bad thing if I have to take 25,000 legitimate prospects out of my database. Right. And so I, you could argue, like, right. I, I would argue that like the, the tactics you use around how you do that, the strong arm nature of what some companies that shall go nameless. That we may have already named that have you will use to do that is one thing, but to let people like Gong Tala Gong does it as well to let people in. It's like be generous. Yeah, just add people, add people. And then those people get in and they love it. And now you don't want to take it away from them, but you have to. Yeah. Pay. Yeah. My, when Microsoft rolled in true up with their licensing, my, my first career was in IT and dealing with the idiosyncrasies of Microsoft licensing was super special back then. Um, when they introduced true up, which is the whole like add away and bill you later. Oh my gosh, life got so much better. And Microsoft probably got more of my money. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's keep going. Watching the clock here. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, you can see where some of these all kind of blend together a little bit, right? Like thinking about, I think one, the point I want to make here when we're talking about expansion, upsell, we start talking about land and expand, is the idea that you know the buying committee may not be exactly the same as the user committee, and so as you think about that customer life cycle and think about the use cases and the needs, and hopefully when you're developing personas, you're thinking about their role in the buying committee, and you're thinking about their relationship and connection with other members of the buying committee. Okay, who now gets to use the product, right? And who needs to who needs to have a great experience using the product, and who needs to be communicated to about the value of the product or the opportunity cost of not having that expansion? Like I, as an executive buyer of software, like even in my own tiny company, like there's tools we pay for that I don't see and use ever. But you know, someone could cer certainly point out, hey, by using X, you're seeing Y benefit. If you used it three times as much, you'd see X benefit, right? That rings a bell with me, so I'm having an internal conversation around that. So understanding the roles amongst the customer committee is really critical in understanding how and where and why to do the upsell. If you're trying to get a renewal at month 11 after not paying attention to someone and their results for you know for that first 11 months, it's not a good place. Yeah, yeah, and if you can communicate it inside the product, that works. But for most of us, that's hard to do because it requires developer resources or whatever. And so there's nothing wrong with a, a QBR from your customer team that gets sent to the head of the team, right? The head of the department. Yeah. Or even better, tell the tell tell my people who are using it to show it to me <laughs> because chances are I'm not going to catch the email. 
Right, right. And, and I think that just because someone is an active customer, you know, I think whether you think of those as product qualified leads, you see some signal within the product or within their usage where they're bumping up against sort of limits of sort of usage, you know, that on their current tier or whatever. Um, just because they're using the product doesn't mean they're going to buy any faster. It doesn't mean that they don't need to be resold on the value prop, right? I mean, especially if you have a product, I mean, churn happens when sellers get complacent when buyers and users turn over and the people that picked it up say, what is this? Why is this? They don't have the same affinity. They don't have, they weren't part of the process of identifying the why and what, what factors went into their commitment to change. And if you aren't constantly communicating that based on what people care about and what they want to hear, and what they need to hear, um, you're setting yourself up, you know, for potential just natural organic churn that, that could have been avoided. Yeah. yeah. And, and about cross sell, if you're, it's interesting because if you cross sell from between departments, so for example, like to use myself as an example, because it's the one that's coming to my mind right now, uh, we can sell into sales or marketing and then sales or marketing can use the product, but the way they use it is different. And as such, we can have signals with product usage to say, Hey, there, this is a good cross sell opportunity, for example. Um, because they've got the marketing version and the sales version has the bells and whistles and we can tell that they're using, trying to use it for sales or, or, or something like that. All right, let's move on to our last, I think our last of the six. No, that was that the last of the six? That we apparently last. can't count today. Yeah. Yeah, we're marketers, you know. I can count to six, sure I can. <laughs> yeah, basically, if you haven't figured it out, we're kind of big fans of product led growth. People want to touch and see your product. They want to use your product. Um, and your product is awesome, right? I mean, I, if it's not awesome, I'm not sure why you're working and you're not on the product team. I'm not sure why you're at your company, but that's between you and your shrink. So, um, and, and using it works well because it's how buyers want to buy these days, but it is change. You will need to do change management, right? Like you need to think, like Matt brought up so much stuff to think about just in this, in this quick session. Um, and you've got to pick and choose what you want to do, what resources need to be involved and how you're going to manage the change. And it is totally possible because we just talked about everything from thought leadership content to land and expand motions. Um, it's totally possible to do it full funnel. Yeah, I'm thankful for the account-based movement because I think it has got, it is, it is encouraged and driven more integration between sales and marketing. You know, just like, you know, social selling, you don't hear us talking about anymore because it's just an evolved way of selling. You know, account-based is an evolved way of going to market between revenue teams. We're seeing that with PLG now in terms of sort of the revenue teams and the product team. And yes, the more we ask for parts of the organization that are used to and we're comfortable working in silos, the more we ask them to work together, the more difficult that's going to be. But this is the experience that the customer expects. This is the experience that your buyers expect. Um, and so you know, Jen is totally right that, you know, this isn't a campaign, this is a culture change. And if we're talking about culture change in an organization, that is not a 45 minute webinar and you get it done. It's not, you know, SKO, wave your hands and say nice things. And then what does it look like on Tuesday? What does it look like in terms of product roadmap? How do you do feature triage? You know, in e either a planned out way or an agile way that maps to some of these motions. Uh, that, is, that, is a, that is a sticky wicket um, and something that isn't always easy to do. Um, but uh, definitely, I think we, we're seeing we're seeing so many examples of companies that are leaning into this and seeing remarkable differences in their performance of their of their of their go to market uh, revenue efforts and really i mean in, in a in a in a category where you know we're seeing increasing media costs increased scrutiny on security issues um, this is an opportunity to really sort of own and manage a relationship uh, with prospects early on directly within your product and then you can stop complaining about millennial buyers and start selling to them. Absolutely. Well, that was a lot of fun. I don't know if we have any more questions in the chat here. I appreciate the uh, interaction. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, we're, you know, we've got a little more time here. If you've got any additional questions, I think we got to the questions that were put in earlier. Um, yeah, I think uh, if anybody has any other questions for me or for Breezy or for Jimmy or for Marketing Hat or for anybody else, um, you know, let us know. I'm happy to chime in on that. But yeah, glad this was valuable for many of you. Cool. Cool. 
Well, Chris, is, is there any housekeeping to do towards the end here? I think that's it. I want to thank everyone for joining uh, with us and we'll be sending out um, a deck and some information shortly after along with the, the recording for, for y'all who want to circle back on it. And um, thanks again. We'll see you at the next session. See everyone. Thanks everyone.